Okay, in this lecture, I will continue to discuss about the discrete Fourier transform. Now, when we discuss about the discrete Fourier transform, according to my previous lecture, if you remember, we talk about equation 7. At that time, equation 7 says something like this. On the left-hand side, you have summation, small n, go from 0 to capital N minus 1, f of n time e raised to the power minus i, l omega 0 times small n. And on the right-hand side, of equation 7, you have something like summation, k go from 0 to capital N minus 1 of C tilde k multiply with summation, small n go from 0 to capital N minus 1 of e raised to the power i i time k minus l k minus l time 2 pi divide by capital N time small n. That is what we have in equation 7 that I already talked to you and explained to you in the previous lecture. Now, what I said to you is this. According to my previous lecture, if you remember, the first, the innermost summation sign, that term right there, at that time in my previous lecture, I call that guy is equal to capital A. And according to my previous lecture, I say depending on k minus l is a multiple integer of capital N or not, we conclude that after considering both cases, capital A, which is the inner summation term, turn out to be equal to capital N. That's where we stopped last time. And that's why that equation 7 now is shown to you as equation 18A. You see, where the so-called inner summation is equal to capital A and that capital A equal to N. So that's what we have in equation 18A. In the previous lecture, you also remember that we say the K minus L is equal to MN, this formula. We have mentioned that before. And in that formula, remember L and m both are integer number. Furthermore, you have to keep in mind that the integer index k must be somewhere in the range from 0 to n minus 1. And the reason is you can see in that formula k index k integer going from 0 to n minus 1. So, because the index k has to be somewhere between 0 to n minus 1. Therefore, the value of m must be equal to 0. This guy, small m, must be equal to 0. Why? Because if m is not equal to 0, let's say m equal to 1 or m equal to 2, in that case then, the index k will be bigger than n minus 1. And that is not acceptable. So, for that reason, the small m must be equal to 0, because otherwise, the value k will not be in that range. So, when, when m equal to 0, what it means is k is the same thing as l. Okay? So, when m equal to 0, it implies that k must be equal to l, according to this formula right there. So, k equal to l. What does that mean? It means, if you look at equation 18a, L 
is the same thing as k. This k is the same thing as l. And this summation on k is only valid for the situation where k is equal to l. So for that reason, equation 18a will become something else, like I show you on the next slide. You see? On the next slide, if you have L and K is the same. You know, that's what you have equation 18B. All right? So, because the index L and K are the same, that's why equation 18A now becomes equation 18B. Now, from that equation, 18B, obviously, let's say we can solve for this guy, which is uh, C theta L. C theta L, according to equation 18B, should be equal to this guy, according to equation 18B. But on the other hand, we know the index L is the same thing as the index K. So, C tilde L or C tilde K is the same thing and is expressed by this right-hand side equation. Now, furthermore, the next thing we can do is we say E raised to the power minus I K omega zero N E raised to that power minus i k omega zero n can be expressed in terms of cosine and sine using the so-called Euler identity. So we can say that e raised to that power can be expressed as cosine and sine based on Euler identity. Euler identity. Okay, so now we have equation 19. Don't forget our notation. We say n represents the time t sub n. Okay, so the function f is given by this expression that we know long time ago. We already talked about that. And Again, uh, you have the term which is e raised to the power i k omega zero n can also be expressed in terms of cosine and psi by using the Euler identity. So this is what I have shown to you equation one earlier that I repeated in here. So. Equation 19 and equation 1, basically, we can uh, summarize again. C sub n is given by this formula, which is indicated in equation 20. And in that formula, equation 20, the value of f sub k can be computed as indicated in equation 21. Again, like I told you earlier, if you compare equation 20 and equation 21, there are some couple of different things. For example, in equation 20, the power exponential of E have a negative sign in the front, whereas in equation 21, there's a plus sign in the front. Furthermore, in equation 20, you don't have a factor 1 over n as you see in equation 21. So, to make the story short, if you remember, in the early day, we can express any periodic function f in terms of the complex unknown constant c tilde n and express in terms of the exponential form. And that unknown c tilde n is given by the formula something similar to equation 20. That again show in here 
the only thing different between equation 20, 21 that I show you now and the similar equation that I told, show you earlier is that now we are talking about at the discretized time n instead of at time t. So that is the major difference between I talked to you before and the so-called discrete Fourier transform. Now,